Come with me to a magical place where being labeled the pork queen is a compliment, where being nice is just a way of life, and where all leaders of the free world must pass through. Welcome to Iowa. Whether you're a current Iowan, an Iowa expat, or an Iowan at heart, this show is for you. This is the Iowa Podcast. Real Iowans, real talk, no drama. If you're not paying attention, the AEA bill is getting some eh, hotly debated. Let's just call it hotly debated. Uh, That is HF 2612, and Senator Lynn Evans, Republican, and Senator Sarah Trone Garriott are in the studio to discuss just that. Thank you to both of you for coming in the show. I really appreciate this. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. It's an issue that a lot of people care about, so we need to keep talking about it. Absolutely. And uh, I'm obviously this show exists because discussion is always a good thing, no matter where you, and obviously neither one of you agree on this, which is perfect. Um, there was a really great quote. I actually use this in client meetings from Peter Drucker. He was one of the he was known as the father of modern management. And there's this discussion with uh, one of his clients, and it's a board meeting, and um, they're all in perfect agreement. And he says, "Gentlemen, it sounds like we're in perfect agreement." They all nod their heads, and he says, "Great. Then I suggest you dismiss and come back when you have ample amounts of disagreement." So I love that quote. So obviously, thanks for walking all the way from the Capitol. You can see it from the window right there. But we'll get right into it. Um, Let's start broadly, because I want to start like how AEAs work, what their purpose is, and what this bill actually does. Just really top level, 30,000 feet, like maybe 30 seconds to a minute. This isn't like a debate thing, it's a conversation, but I think that'll give us a good starting point. So, um, Senator Evans, let's start with you. How do they work? What's the purpose? And like, how are they funded? How are they structured? And what changed? There are currently nine AEAs across the state of Iowa, and they um, provides supports to school districts for things like special education, uh, education services. Uh, a lot of people would think of those as uh, professional development, curriculum supports, those type of things, um, and media services. And those originally, when the AAs were set up, those were the three main purposes for the AEA. Um, they were set up in 1974. At that time, there were 15 AAs across the state. Mm. Uh, special ed is portion is funded with state and federal special ed dollars that flow through a school district's budget out to the AA, and uh, the ed service and media services portion of uh, the funding are property tax dollars, and again those flow through the local school district's budget and are dedicated to go out to the AA. So that's currently how they're set up. All right, and that's uh, I'll just let you do a and background as well on them as well. So the AAs are an integrated system, and you have all of these different disciplines and opportunities and resources working collaboratively to support school districts. And one AEA specialist described it like an insurance policy for schools. They're ready for anything and everything, and if a school district needs them, they can spring into action and respond accordingly as much or as long as needed. But if they don't, then they they don't have to utilize those services in the moment. So they're very flexible because of that integration, because of that collaboration. And that's why the changes in this legislation are so problematic. It's pulling apart this integrated system and destabilizing significant portions of it. Yeah. And so you mentioned they can kind of expand and breathe with schools. And so is, is that gray area, the expansion, the flexibility of the funding, is that kind of the point of disagreement between both parties on this bill? Like um, one side is like the expansion and the flexibility is how they're designed. That's supposed to be that way. And then the Republicans are like the expansion. Get, it, this is where the transparency accountability language comes from. Is it the gray area right there? Maybe gray area is probably not the best word, but is it the flexibility of the program that's the central point of concern? I think that legislators did not really understand how the AEAs worked before this whole idea came from the governor. I definitely learned a lot about the AEAs. And to Mm. understand that there aren't specific line items for all of these critical services, that it's really about folks shifting their time, shifting their energies to provide those resources, um, that's 
I think an oversight of the legislative process is that you can't really account for all of the time and energy that these folks are putting in to provide critical services because they're not specific buckets, they're not specific line items. So your concern is that um, due to that flexibility, there are some important things that will probably fall between the cracks because we can't account for every single circumstance. Is this fair assessment and you can push back on that. Just one one example is crisis response services. Mm. So we saw this in Perry that we had a significant number of folks spring into action to run crisis communications, parent reunification, immediately start providing support to the community, the educators, the students um, for crisis counseling and then ongoing supports. That is not a specific line item. Those are mm. staff coming from that particular AEA, but AEA is all over the place. We're getting pulled in to respond because it was such a huge need. And so AEAs do that on varying levels all across the state. If there's a student death or a teacher death, any traumatic incident, they can be activated in small groups or larger depending on the need. Well, that's an example of a service that may fall through the cracks because you will have less people available to be pulled in for those moments. Is that one of the AEA's functions is like emergency and crisis response? And was it was it through like counseling? Is that what they were doing? Um, and either one of you can jump in on this. Yeah, AEA is for a number of years have provided uh, mental health supports. OK, for school got districts, it. And that would fall under under this got topic it. where and they so- where they come in events of crisis. I don't know. A lot of people may not know I'm a former school administrator myself, so um, have had extensive work with AEAs throughout my career. Um, and, that, yeah, that is one of the services they've provided that, sadly, I've had to take advantage of as well. Mm, mm-hmm. One thing that needs to be pointed out is that there are literally, in, in any individual school district, and I'm talking even smaller districts now, hundreds of thousands of dollars that pass through a school's budget out to an AEA. And we receive a bundle of services back in return. But never have we received a report on what we're getting back, what we've utilized in those services. Uh, some of those, as I mentioned, are local property tax dollars. A school board's never had an ability to weigh in on how those funds are budgeted or how they're expended. Mm-hmm. So as a, as a superintendent, I think it's important to me to know what have, what have we taken advantage of? What have we not taken advantage of? What am I getting back in return for the money that went through my my budget? And how am I going to report this back to my school board? Now, it may be a discussion that, Superintendent Evans, you're not taking advantage of X, Y, and Z. Why? The question from the school board. Mm-hmm. And we look into maybe taking better advantage of those. It also may be that we're not taking advantage of these, and is it because we don't think we can use those services. We don't need those services or we're already providing them locally ourselves. Mm. Uh, We've never received that, what I call a bill of sale or a return on investment, to actually make some valued decisions. Um, That's the transparency piece that we've been lacking with AEAs. And unfortunately, um, this legislation was enacted before we got a clear picture of what the AEAs are providing. So there were a lot of folks in the community that said, hold up, let's spend a year doing a thorough review and study so we can adequately understand what the AEAs are providing, what is their value, where are those opportunities to make improvements, and then enact legislation. Instead, we have legislation coming into effect, and there will be a task force as part of that, but it's then going to be studying a system in chaos because the changes that are being enacted are destabilizing this integrated system. The, okay, so how much time does the task force have um, to say, hold up, here's the data, we need to rethink this? How much time do they have? None. They don't have any time at no, all? No, the changes are enacted immediately. Because um, wouldn't you be able to make changes by December if, if something is a glaring issue or, an issue or a problem? I could be wrong. There's nothing that would uh, prevent the task force from bringing up issues that either we haven't addressed or we need to be Mm. discussing further. Um, It doesn't have to be the end of the discussion where we're at now. And actually, I'm hoping that it does uncover, one, what are the services that are being provided by schools? Should we continue to be providing those services? Are they being utilized or Mm. not? Or are they underutilized and why? Um, uh, some other things that need to be addressed and will be looked at through the task force 
is, are ad, administrative costs. Mm. Um, we know that chief administrators get paid pretty well. They have a they have a good salary package, and <clears throat> most of it, most is deservedly so. But when you look at a uh, three hundred ten thousand average package among nine AA chiefs, is that reasonable? That needs to be discussed. Also. Um, there's another layer of administration. These are people that don't work directly with kids and families. Um, and they're earning currently over 100, 120 positions that are currently earning over 130000 a year. Do we need all those in place okay. as well? So, so uh, those are taxpayer dollars that are going for those services. Yeah, quickly, but, um, and then I have a follow-up question. Yeah. A, a lot of these changes are being implemented jul- July 1. Mm. So there's no time for discussion. And we're seeing impacts of the legislation already. We've seen a number of supportive programs through the Department of Ed being cut, um, unfunded, changing providers. And so already the system is starting to be pulled apart. We haven't even... Um, put this bill into practice, but that will be happening with the new fiscal year. So there's very little time for us to have any conversation, and there was very little time during the process of creating this legislation for the public to truly weigh in. So the concern there is, okay, great, there's a task force. That's great. That I mean, We're happy about that. However, we don't really have any guarantees that if this task force finds anything, we're going to make any changes at all, which, which is understandable. I, I like the Perry example, uh, in that example, what were to ha- let, let's for- fast forward two years, uh, same scenario. What are AEAs unable to respond to that? Um, are they gone now? How how would this functionally change the Perry example? You 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 correctly mentioned that the AEAs uh, went and helped in that in that scenario. So with this new bill fully implemented, does that change and, and how so? Well, we see that funding for education services and media services change pretty dramatically. So schools have the option to participate or not. So starting right away, a good portion of that money just stays with the schools if they choose. And they can use it for keeping the lights on. They can use it for those general budget needs, which they have plenty of. And so schools are having to make some really tough choices. Do we pay for this or do we pay for that? Do we pay for something that might happen or do we pay for something that is happening right now? That's a really tough position for them to be in. And we're already seeing resignations at the AEA level. Service providers are reading the writing on the wall and saying, we don't know if we're going to be funded next year. We think the system's in chaos and we don't know if I'm going to have a job. So people are going to look for security and stability. And so we're seeing a lot of transition already with the AEAs. We won't know from year to year which schools are going to be participating on those education and media services, which means the AEAs won't know if they can hire. They don't know if they can retain those staff. They don't know how much they can budget for, which makes it very, very hard to have those service providers ready to jump into action. So we don't know what it's going to look like in two years. And there's also an effort on the Department of Education to be looking at private entities to be fulfilling some of these service lines, it's, it's in the job descriptions of the Department of Ed in this legislation, is they will be looking for outside options, private entities, to be part of this system, which means um, another fragmentation of an integrated system. When, want, you, when you look at the crisis yeah. services, mm-hmm. um, they are integrated, but they're funded primarily with Ed service dollars uh, in most AEAs. That's now under the decision of local school boards on how those monies are and being this used. Is the so, central... so if I'm a school board member, I, I'm I'm trusting of my school boards that they're going to look, <clears throat> excuse me, at critical services. I would say crisis support and mental health services are critical services. They're going to want to participate in those through the AA. I, I think we have to have a little more faith in our local school boards then than what uh, people are concerned about. And, and you bro- both brought that up. And this is like the major structural change just from a top level. And I do fully understand in these conversations, there's nuance, maybe there's things I'm not quite aware of. But the major structural change here is that AEA um, leadership transfers under the local school districts, right? The local superintendent, superintendents and school boards. And 
like that, like the the local school boards and school superintendents are now in charge of the AEAs, right? And the AEAs are supposed to serve those school boards and school attendants. Is is it, am I right that that's you're you're shaking your head? Not necessarily, uh, no. Okay, so no. W- where did I get that wrong? Well, so, so the special ed service dollars are still going to the stay first the year. State. They go. Thank no, you for that. They yeah, go with right. the AEA. Yeah. So the AEA is still going to be in, in right. fully in control year one. Ninety percent automatically go to the AEA. Right. Year two, ten percent remain locally. But any AEA services or any special ed services that that school district needs, they can only do business with the AEA for right. special ed. So that can't be contracted out. So if, if it's not provided locally, they have to do business with the and AEA. And that's managed by the State Department of Education, correct? No. No. That's okay. The AEAs will still be in control of that. Now, the Department under the, of Ed— Under the local school board and superintendent? Not necessarily. Okay. The AEA still have some of their own responsibilities. The ed service dollars and the media services dollars, those are going to become under the control of the local school board Mm -hmm. and how those are expended with the AEA or controlled locally. Um, If they choose to pass those on to the AEA fully, they can. If they want to use them in-house, they can. Um, That's up to them. Now, where the Department of Ed comes in is uh, Department of Ed has now regulatory responsibility and compliance with uh, special ed uh, laws and mandates, both federally and um, in the state of Iowa. Uh, that's honestly where I believe it should be. That's where in 1974, when AEAs were conceived and put into place, the Department of Education had the responsibility to oversight the special education. That was shifted over to the AEAs a number of years ago. Uh, so they've been overseeing themselves for compliance. Uh, that's that's a major change. Yeah, that is yeah. the Senator yeah. Trone Garrett. I'm assuming you agree that's the major the major focus change. Again, it's fragmenting an integrated system and pulling apart who's in charge and where is the funding coming from. And there's this mistaken assumption that special ed services are somehow distinct and separate from media and education services. One service provider said to me that um, they had a student move in from out of state with an extremely complex health, behavioral, and medical need. And so that same day, they asked a speech-language pathologist, an itinerant vision specialist, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, an educational trial for the student and support staff, immediate access was possible because of the integrated system. But if we had to parse out which services were available and which services were funded and didn't then determine if the school was part of that system and how much, um, how much could they actually provide for them? Uh, it, it, it pulls apart all of these resources, the assistive devices, the learning materials, the teacher education supports um, that are funded through these different buckets. And now you don't have that comprehensive, integrative response. Do you find, and this is both of you, do you find that the special education and uh, children with disabilities getting support through the AEA, that often comes hand in hand with certain media services. And because these come hand in hand and they're uh, split, I wouldn't say necessarily split, that's probably not fair, but because perhaps they're more fragmented, I'll just use that word, as they were before, you think that people aren't going to get the full suite of services that they're used to? Is this the, the, is the, this assist- the challenge? The assistive technology in most AEAs, assistive technology is, okay. is, yeah. is a portion of the media services. And so that so that, now I send a bundle of money through my budget that goes out to the AEAs for media services, mm-hmm. and I get back a bundle of services in return. So money goes out uh, through my budget. I get a bundle of services in return. So now if I have a student that um, an audi- an audiologist comes in and says we need a piece of assistive technology, we'd like to try it out. The AEA just says, sends a bill to us. We send out a PO, and we get it. It's not going to change the the speed of delivery. I mean, we're in a living in a world now where we can get something delivered overnight. That'll still be available to schools, but instead of the money automatically going, the schools are going to provide that money to the AEAs for those. Or, I would suggest put together a subscription service for schools, where. This bundle of services is going to cost you this much, and you just pay that out automatically on the front side. So the concern is efficiency. And this one example, there are many, but the concern is you're saying 
uh, Senator Sharon Garriott, that efficiency will be hurt. Things won't, we won't be as responsive as we should be. And Senator Evans, you're saying, no, we're still going to be very responsive. We're, this is the one of, of, of a few, but this is one of the concerns. So will a uh, AEA be able to offer assistive devices to trial if they don't have enough money to actually purchase those devices? And how much time will the AEAs now have to spend trying to determine what the value of every service, every device, every opportunity is worth? And if a school district says, well, we're going to buy into the AEAs a piece, but not completely, well, then do they say you only get half the value that we used to provide to you? It's very complicated to try to pull apart these pieces. Um, the idea that all of this is still going to be available if the funding's uncertain, will you have the people who can actually deliver the items to the school? Will you have the fuel for the van to load up the devices and take it there? Um, it's it's really unclear how it's actually going to work out in practice because we don't know which school districts and how much are going to buy into these services. And it's every year. It's unclear yeah. what's going to be happening. That's a lot of chaos for a system that used to be able to at least know this is the funding we've got to work with each and every year. I mean, I can see both sides of this. Um, and again, this is going to be an oversimplification. So there are going to be inaccuracies in the oversimplification. There always are. That's why our bills are like, you know, tens and this, what was it, bill like 48 pages or something, which isn't a, actually not a long bill. Um, but like any time, like if I'm working on a client project and I say some, you know, someone gives me this more broad budget, that's a, I have a little bit more freedom to work within the budget. But anytime they say, hey, you know, here, you, here, here's a more restrictive budget. You we need to only be spending money on X, Y, and Z. Here's what we've budgeted. It becomes a little harder for me to operate. But that being said, I happen to manage the budget better. So, you know, it's, it's both, I, I can see kind of both sides of this. Why in one case that it would be more difficult for, pe for people to operate, but I can also see where there may be a bit more accountability in watching the budget, right? So I can see on both sides what the point here is i can also see what a challenge uh what challenges may present themselves what well, you brought up some uh examples uh senator trone gary about like uh, constituents and what they're telling you what were senator evans i want to ask you this what were the problems if any i i assume there are some that warranted this bill uh because I think the governor mentioned like accountability and transparency need to be improved. Consistency. These are the words that we see used a lot. So what were those core problems that uh, either she or Republicans, maybe Democrats, I don't know, identified and said these core things here are issues. We see abuse here. Maybe it's not nefarious. Maybe it's just like there's a lot of waste here. These need to be patched up to get more funding to actual education. What were those core things? Well, one of the things that came out um, was that uh, there's a larger gap between our special ed students and our general education students uh, in the state of Iowa as compared to similar states, especially those around us, <clears throat> and that we're spending more money uh, for those services. So we're not necessarily seeing the, uh, the best return on our investment as far as closing the gap. Now, a lot of people point to uh, the Guidehouse study, but... Um, we can look at other data uh, beyond what was presented in, in that study. We can look at our own uh, ISAP scores, uh, which is the Iowa test, and similar gaps appear. Now, that, that current test has been in place for about five years, but you can look even beyond that, um, where there's a significant gap between special education students and, and those who are not on IEPs, which in, in some ways makes sense. Otherwise, they wouldn't need the special education services, but we should be working to close that gap. Interestingly, when you look at our own Iowa scores, and this, this is easily searchable, those school districts that have a lower SES, a lower SES socioeconomic status, kids who are in poverty, they have a lower number of those, are actually performing um, more poorly as far as the gap between the students that have IEPs and those who do not. Um, that's a question that needs to be looked into further. This bill isn't necessarily going to uncover that, but um, it, we're not just looking at one piece of data when we're looking at that. So that's partly what's driving it. Uh, Iowa's been named a, a state in need of assistance in special ed services for from the Department of Education more than two years. And actually it goes back to 
2018. Um, they're going to be on site in in Des Moines this fall, and they're going to they're going to be looking and reviewing at what we're doing with our special ed in the state of Iowa and how we're addressing this to no longer be a state need of assistance. Now there are a number of states that have been designated needs of assistance. It's not just an Iowa thing. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be digging in and doing the work. Obviously, we should be doing a better job in that area. Senator Trone Garrett, yeah. The entire premise of this legislation was based on a study by an out-of-state consultant who did not meet with special education teachers, families, or AEAs. And the, the information in the Guidehouse study is inaccurate. And so it was the governor looking for things to point to to justify her effort. For years, we've been cutting about 18 to $20 million out of the AEAs every single year because the governor had other plans for that money. She has a different vision for public education in our in our state, and so just grabbing at anything to point to. But before this bill came out, I never heard a word about AEAs from the public when I was out door knocking in um, conversations at the Capitol. And now all I hear when I go out and knock on doors is that the AEAs are valuable to people and they don't want them ruined. They don't want them pulled apart like this. I'm hearing that from educators, from service providers, from families, from folks who work in the community, um, from a lot of parents of kids who have special needs. And none of this is shown to improve incomes, shifting all of this all of this money to do more oversight by the Department of Ed, pulling apart this integrated system. There was nothing in the test results that our governor is pointing to that say the AEAs were the problem. She's not going after classroom teachers. She, you know, she's not saying there's other issues in the wider community that we need to address. She's targeting the AEAs and none of this is demonstrated to improve outcomes for kids. What it is is a great big experiment that's going to hurt the system. And the way the legislative process moved forward was, you know, here's an idea. And then the Republicans in the House are like, here's a different idea. And then the Senate Republicans are like, here's something else that we could possibly do. And it just felt like throwing things at the wall to try to get something more palatable so they could pass it to make the governor happy. Why, why bother doing that? Because uh, don't Republicans have the control? Like, why bother changing it at all? Because I did note it, I think it was the Gazette noted that this bill is significantly different from the original proposal. So, uh, and either one of you can answer that, but why bother changing it at all? Trying to get um, Republican legislators on board. So Republican what? legislators were not on board with the first one, is the, that? Uh, the first bill from, that came out from the government. This is solely my opinion, so yeah, this is just what, Senator And that's Evans what this speaking. show's about, okay. solely your opinions. That's why I want you in here. <laughs> went, went too far. Okay. Uh, it only addressed special education services, and it actually removed funding for ed services and media services. Now, as a person who has been in education their entire career, I understood how important those pieces were, that we needed, we mm. could not take those funding away. I... I didn't like that the school boards, local superintendents, didn't have some say in how those mm, okay. dollars are being used or control. Those dollars need to remain in the system. So when we originally rejected the, the governor's first proposal, and she, she quickly put out a revised edition that put those dollars back in. Um, so can we? That's where the, the discussion actually grew some legs from there. Okay, so can we at least call it a small win? I mean, I understand. I fully understand Democrat priorities did not align with the bill, right? I understand that. But can we at least call it a small win? Yeah, that maybe no. it changed a little bit? You're saying no. No, no it's still I terrible. I tried, everybody. I it's tried. still terrible. And what we've seen is that there's a heck of a lot of Republican legislators who were opposed and spoke yeah, against it. Yeah, how many it. were opposed? I, I don't have the number. You I'm know, so sorry. It kept shifting based on how much arm twisting had happened, how much threatening 
happening and how much um, horse trading with different pieces of legislation, as well as trying to um, tweak parts of the bill to make it more palatable for the legislators. So one one just because I, I told you both I'm going to respect your time. We're mm-hmm. coming up on the 30 minute mark. And so one one thing I want to get in here right at the end before we go is. Um, I did notice another pattern in this was sending funding like through IEPs now, AEAs, professional development uh, and disability support now extends to non-public. This is what the bill said, not my words, non-public accredited schools or something, something to that. I have it written down somewhere. Is that also a point of contention that um, AEA support and IEPs can go in to non-public schools? Because we look at the last bill and there was a lot of um, division over public versus non-public. Or some. So is this one of the last contention points as the well? A, the AEAs have always had a responsibility to serve accredited non-public students. Um, the actual IEPs, the public school had to be a part of that because that's how the federal and state dollars flowed through to serve those students in private schools. So that was just clarifying language. And actually we had an amendment in the previous revision that got changed in the House version, but that language didn't really need to be in there because it's it's already a part of special education law that those kids have to have access to those services. And you know, one, and I'm just gonna give you one specific example, audiology services are provided to um, non, accredited non-public schools right now um, and those those are to every child who who wants to be tested any, any thoughts on they, that and then yeah, i'm also going to do final remarks too for about 30 it's seconds. true aeas are incredibly valuable to every school in iowa including the private schools and they were also very opposed to these changes and so any language that was put in the bill was trying to get them on board to ensure them that they would still have supports and services um, and there was quite a bit of nudging saying hey we got you this um this voucher money as well so you should get on board but still they could see it was a bad thing for iowa for their students too Senator Lynn Evans and Senator Sarah Trone Garriott, before you go, this is your time, so you can make it as short or as long as you want, but before you go, like a 30-second close on your last thoughts, I want to make sure I'm 100% fair to both of you for your time, so if there's something I didn't get into or something you just need to put a final period on, please do so now. Uh, Senator Trone Garriott, we'll start with you. So when you look at who was at the bill signing, you can see who this legislation was for. There weren't any parents, any kids with disabilities, any educators, AEA members there. It was Republican legislators primarily, and not all of them, because there were quite a few who said, this is the bill that nobody wanted. Uh, Senator McClintock um, spoke on the floor in opposition to this legislation. So it was bipartisan opposition And this legislation was really about pleasing the governor, and it wasn't about meeting the needs of the community. It wasn't about making our public education or our private education system stronger in the state. And when you listen to the people of Iowa, this is an incredibly unpopular effort, and folks are right to be very concerned about the impact it's going to have. And that will bear out in time, but we're already seeing negative impacts as folks are resigning, as positions go un- unfilled, as AEAs say, we don't know if we can hire for these roles. And there's just so much uncertainty now in this system that school districts used to be able to count on to show up for them for whatever needs they had. And now that's just a big question mark. Senator Evans? Yeah, I think what this bill does is add some local control into the system. It allows uh, your local school boards to have more say in how the dollars are being spent and utilized for their kids locally. I I can test who knows their own children better than the people sitting around your local school board tables. Um, I'm hearing from superintendents and have heard from superintendents across the state. Matter of fact, Senator McClintock's own superintendent, Charlie's from uh, Alburnett. His superintendent is Will Dibel. I hired Will as a first-year teacher right out of college, and uh, Will and I have had conversations over the past few weeks. He would like to see some changes in how the AEAs operate. I have a number of superintendents in my area in northwest Iowa that would like to see changes. Now I have some that also would like to see them remain the same. So... um, Giving the local school district, school boards, more control over some of those dollars 
overall in, in the long term is going to be a good thing. It's, we're going to be, have a more efficient system uh, come out of this as a result. Senator Lynn Evans and Senator Sarah Trone Garriott. And for those that haven't been in this position before, this is hard. Like being interviewed by someone with the opposition with your bill is sitting right there is very, very difficult. And I don't really think if you haven't done an interview on a podcast or, or a TV before, it's very, very difficult. And conversations like this are difficult just without being recorded. They are very, very difficult. And I believe this is one of the reasons we're having fewer of them these days. So I really appreciate both of you coming in here and having this discussion for Iowans. I truly appreciate it. Senator Lynn Evans and Senator Senator Sarah Trone Garriott, thank you to both of you for coming on the Iowa podcast. I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. And to my fellow Iowans, Iowa expats, and Iowans at heart, thanks for listening and subscribing to the Iowa podcast.